Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our the beginning of our last week of regular class. So I'm going to start with some announcements, and then we'll jump right into today's material. So let me share my screen here. And... And we will get started. So happy Monday to everyone. Um, so here's some, uh, let's start with some announcements. So I just want to remind you that the quiz on the digestive system is currently open and it will close at midnight tonight. So if you have not completed that, please do so. Today, we'll, we're going to end our discussion on the respiratory system. I will then assign uh, a second quiz on the respiratory system. And that's going to be your last quiz, lecture quiz of the semester. Uh, and once it is graded, then I'll drop your two lowest quiz grades and update your overall grade and score. After we finish the respiratory system, we'll start the urinary system. And as I said, um, we'll, you're going to have a, your last quiz, which will be Master of the Respiratory System. It will open um, today, and it will be due on Wednesday. That'll be your last quiz. I want to remind you that you have a practical this week. This is your third and final practical. Use the Quizlets and the Practice Practical number three to prepare for your last practical. Your practical is going to open on Thursday, May 14th at 8 a.m., and it will close at Friday, May 15th at midnight. I also want to remind you that the uh, Quizlets will not be open or available during the practical. So even if you decide you're not going to actually take the practical until Friday. You won't be able to study using the Quizlets, at least, on Thursday. Okay? Um, what's going to be covered on the practical? Well, everything since your last practical, which would be anatomy of blood vessels and the heart, functional anatomy of the digestive system, as well as the anatomy of the respiratory system. Okay. So with that, I want to Goodness gracious. So with that, I just want to ask if there are any questions before I start where we left off on Friday on the respiratory system. Any questions at all? All right. Well, let's talk respiratory system. So where we left off on Friday was where I was talking about control of breathing. And we said that there you have a certain amount of conscious control of breathing, but it is limited. Uh, and we said that um, emotions can affect respiration, uh, such as anxiety, or um, if you are looking at a movie and you're waiting for something to happen with bated breath, um, that can affect emotion. But I'm sorry, that can affect um, um, a pulmonary ventilation or breathing, but the most powerful and ultimate regulator of breathing is the nervous system. The medulla oblongata and the pons contain your respiratory centers, and they primarily work by responding to changes in carbon dioxide levels and pH. In fact, those are the most important regulators for breathing. So how does that work? Well, the medulla oblongata responds to, responds to changes in pH of the cerebral spinal fluid that bathes the medulla oblongata. The cerebral spinal fluid is made from blood. So as the pH of blood changes, the pH of cerebral spinal fluid changes and the medulla oblongata responds. Now let's recall the relationship between carbon dioxide in the blood and pH. So carbon dioxide interacts with water, and remember the plasma is 90% water, to form carbonic acid, H2CO3, soda pop, and 
carbonic acid then dissociates into carb bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So what this means is the, the higher the carbon dioxide levels in the blood, the more acidic or the lower the pH would be. So this is a reversible at reaction. And that's what the, the double arrows mean. It can proceed to the right or it can proceed to the left, depending on the relative um, concentrations of the reactants versus the product. So the higher the carbon dioxide levels, that's going to shift the equation to the right, and the higher your hydrogen ion concentration or lower the pH, the more acidic it is. The lower the carbon dioxide levels, that's going to shift, shift this equation to the left, and so the lower your hydrogen ion concentrations and therefore the higher the pH. And basically, the way the medulla oblongata uh, controls breathing is responding to pH. All right, so you're going to want to commit this equation to memory because not, not only for understanding the relationship between carbon dioxide and pH, uh, but you're going to see this equation again in the urinary system when we talk about the control of pH by not only the respiratory system, but the urinary system. And you really can't understand that unless you know this equation, right? And it's not difficult to, to remember carbon dioxide and water yields by, excuse me, carbonic acid, which then associates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So as blood pH decreases, how does the respiratory system respond? Well, in order to keep pH in the normal range, respiration rate is going to increase. So think about this. If carbon dioxide levels in the blood increase, that increases hydrogen ion concentration and lowers pH. Your lungs respond by trying to shift this equation to the left, trying to get rid of more carbon dioxide so it can have less hydrogen ions and raise pH. And therefore, as blood pH decreases, respiration rate will increase. This is why if when you hold your breath, you get that urge to breathe. What's happening is when you hold your breath, carbon dioxide levels in your blood are increasing, pH is falling, and your medulla oblongata is responding to that drop in pH and is sending signals giving you the urge to breathe. Let's look at the flip side. What if pH levels increase? Well, that causes an increase in respiration excuse me, that causes a decrease in respiration rate because if hydrogen ion concentration is decreasing, the way to restore pH or increase that hydrogen ion concentration is if carbon dioxide levels in the blood increase. And so if after a, a, you've had an episode of hyperventilation, once it stops, Individuals who have hyperventilated for a time, sometimes they'll stop breathing altogether for a short period of time. And then after that, their breathing will be much slower. Their body is, their medulla oblongata is responding to that decrease in hydrogen ion concentration by reducing ventilation, trying to get carbon dioxide levels up to uh, increase hydrogen ion concentration and drive pH back down to the normal range. Now, typically breathing responses of the respiratory system to changes in pH are much more subtle than this. So subtle that you wouldn't even uh, detect changes in your respiration rate. They occur, they're subtle and they occur all the times and you're not even aware of. This is also why this effect of um, carbon dioxide levels on pH is also why, historically anyway, after a period of hyperventilation, people were told to breathe into a bag. Because when you hyperventilate, you blow off carbon dioxide. That drops the hydrogen ion concentration. So in an effort to restore pH, back to its normal range, people were giving a bag and, and, and asked to rebreathe air that they were exhaling because that air they're exhaling is higher in carbon dioxide than normal air 
And so that was seen as a mechanism by, to restore pH, carbon dioxide levels, and then pH. Before moving on, I, I want to uh, contrast two um, terms to make sure you understand the difference. That's hyperpnea and hyperventilation. Both are an increase above the normal rate of respiration. Hyperpnea, however, is an increase in breathing rate and depth in response to an increase in oxygen demand by the body. This is what happens when, for example, you exercise, right? You exercise, your muscles are doing more work, they require more ATP, therefore they need more oxygen. So you breathe faster and more deeply. That is hyperpnea. That is a normal response to a increase in oxygen demand by the body. Hyperventilation, in contrast, is an increase in breathing rate and depth in, in the absence of an increase in oxygen demand by the body. Hyperventilation is what occurs when one starts breathing quickly, uh, when they're having a panic attack or anxiety of something of that nature. It does not serve to maintain homeostasis. In fact, it can cause a homeostatic imbalance. So that's the difference between hyperpnea and hyperventilation. Hyperpnea is an increase in response, increase in breathing rate in response to an increase in oxygen demand. Hyperventilation is an increase in breathing rate in the absence of an increase in the oxygen requirements of the body. Now, does the medulla oblongata respond to lack of oxygen? Yes, it does, but it is much less sensitive to a lack of oxygen uh, compared to um, its sensitivity to pH. Typically, uh, so you do have oxygen sensors in the aorta and the carotid arteries, but typically the medulla only responds when oxygen levels have reached uh, dangerous levels, right? So it's not very responsive, uh, re sensitive at all. And that is why if you've ever taken a, a, a trip in a plane or a commercial plane, when they're going through the safety procedures, uh, they always tell you that if there is a loss of cabin pressure, the uh, oxygen masks will fall from the ceiling and they tell you to take the oxygen mask and put them on. They don't say, wait until you feel like you need to breathe and then put the, ox and then put the oxygen mask on. Okay, please make sure off mic, whoever, thank you. They tell you to immediately put them on. And they also tell you to place them on yourself first before you assist a child. And the reason why this is, is because you can, uh, one, become sort of drunk, what's called narcosis, due to a lack of oxygen. And so you may not have an interest in putting the mask on if you wait too long. Uh, and two, you can lose consciousness very quickly. If you're at 35,000 feet and you lose cabin pressure, you can pass out within um, literally anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute. So you're told to put those oxygen masks on yourself first before you assist the child because while you're putting the mask on the child, you very well could, pa uh, could pass out, lose consciousness. And then the child might be too small uh, to put the oxygen mask on you. To sort of bring this point home, I don't know if, um, uh, given it's you know, the youth of many of you, uh, but back in 1999, uh, Payne Stewart, who was a – um, professional golfer, uh, boarded a plane that was supposed to go to Dallas, Dallas, Texas from Orlando. And at some point in that ride, there was a loss of cabin pressure. Uh, he, his plane stopped responding to hails from um, air traffic control. They scrambled a couple of jets to um, sort of fly beside his jet, and they reported that there was no movement inside and that there were ice crystals that were noted inside the plane. What had happened is that plane had lost cabin pressure 
and the um, oxygen system supposed to uh, automatically be enabled uh, was not enabled. And so what happened is that plane basically flew uh, on autopilot until it eventually lost um, fuel and then crashed uh, in South Dakota. Luckily, it crashed into a field and no one was hurt. But it just so shows you the, that um, the impact of a loss of oxygen and how the uh, and how and how that affects the body. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about a few respiratory disorders. Uh, one that you've probably seen qu quite a few commercials for on TV uh, these days, and that's COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary uh, disease. And then we're going to talk a very, very, very briefly about cancers. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is a group of diseases where there's a chronic obstruction to airflow and a reduction of pulmonary ventilation. And there are two primary ones, and they are um, emphysema and chronic, um, chronic bronchitis. Now, COPD is a major cause of death and disability in the United States. A common features of COPDs are the following. Almost always, but not always, uh, patients have some history of either smoking or they worked in a situation where they were exposed to some type of respiratory toxin. Patients with COPD have what's called labored breathing. Sometimes it's called air hunger, where they're breathing heavy almost like the kind of breathing that you'd have after um, exercise. But of course, these people are at rest. And typically, they cough frequently, and they are subject to frequent infections of the respiratory system. In most cases, there is what's called a respiratory acidosis. Basically, they have high levels of carbon dioxide, and low blood pH because they're not able to move sufficient amounts of air through their lungs, and so carbon dioxide levels are high. If they live long enough, this is a chronic condition that typically worsens over time, and if they don't die from something else, they will eventually die from respiratory failure or complications related to respiratory failure. So as I mentioned, the most common COPDs and the only ones we're going to really talk about are chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Let's take chronic bronchitis first. So itis means inflammation. So this is inflammation of the bronchi, specifically um, the mucosa of the lower respiratory passages. Now, probably many of you have had bronchitis. But you probably had acute bronchitis. You had it for a week, maybe a couple of weeks. I had bronchitis when I was a kid. This is That's not the kind of bronchitis I'm talking about. We're talking about chronic bronchitis, which is typically longer than three months, although there are some individuals that get recurring bronchitis every year. That would also be considered chronic as well, although not as serious as a, as a persistent chronic bronchitis. So what it seems to cause it is prolonged exposure to smoking or some type of respiratory toxin or allergen. And so the lower respiratory passages are in a constant prolonged state of inflammation that causes the destruction of the mucosa, destruction of the cilia, there's excessive mucus production and other fluids, and those fluids tend to accumulate in the lungs because the cilia aren't available to mobilize that mucus and move it out of the respiratory tract. So you'll get pooled mucus. That mucus interferes with ventilation, and if it pools in the respiratory zone, it can literally um, provide a barrier for diffusion of gases across the respiratory membrane. So it can be a decrease in gas exchange. Uh, a nursing uh, um, instructor told me that one of the um, common signs of someone with chronic bronchitis, they wake up in the morning and they literally will uh, cough up 
like a cup of mucus. So there's huge productions of mucus. That mucus, associated with that mucus, you also have tissue destruction. And so you have this sputum that they will cough up, which is a mixture of mucus and dead cells or components of cells. People with bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, tend to become hypoxic, meaning they're not, they're not getting sufficient amounts of oxygen to their tissues very early in um, this disease. And so uh, they will also tend to be cyanotic where their extremities will become blue. And so you have this individual that has air hunger and also a bluish tone to their skin. And so sometimes they are referred to as blue bloaters because they have that blue skin tone and they are um, um, finding it difficult to breathe. Another COPD of the, of, the, of the two most common is emphysema. Emphysema is basically fibrosis of the lungs. If you remember what fibrosis is, fibrosis is the replacement of damaged tissue with scar tissue or dense regular tissue. So you get this destruction of the walls of the alveoli or the normal uh, tissue of those alveoli, usually as a result of exposure to cigarette smoke, although it could be due to other uh, toxins as well. With emphysema, what we see is not only a destruction of the mucosa, but you actually find that the walls between the alveoli of an alveolar sac will literally break down. If you look at this normal alveolar sac here at the bottom, do you see how you have some walls between the individual alveoli? If we look at a alveolar sac here above it on an individual with emphysema, notice that those walls are gone. So we've lost a significant amount of respiratory membrane of surface area. That's going to have a huge effect on um, gas exchange. It's going to be greatly reduced. Second, because we've had lung fibrosis, we've lost elasticity when the normal tissue of the lungs is destroyed and replaced by dense regular connective tissue, it's not as elastic. And elasticity refers to the ability to return to your normal shape after stretching. So think about the walls of your lungs or the, these alveoli like a rubber band. You take a rubber band, you stretch it, and then when you let go of it, it recoils. Well, that's sort of how your lungs work when you exhale. Imagine now having uh, a um, elastic band that's lost its elasticity. Maybe it will stretch too far. You stretch it out, it doesn't recoil. That occurs with someone with emphysema. And in fact, those, the bronchioles will tend to collapse when they're exhaling, and they'll actually trap air in, to, in their lungs. And so people with emphysema have to use a huge amount of energy moving air out of their lungs when they exhale. That's why someone with emphysema has a reduction in their um, vital capacity, primarily due to a decrease in um, expiratory reserve volume. People with emphysema, because they have that air trapped inside, will tend to have a, this overinflated barrel chest. But because of that increase in air in their chest, they don't tend to become cyanotic until toward the end of the disease. So unlike, uh, so like someone with bronchitis, they will have that air hunger, but without the bluish tone to their skin. So someone with emphysema is often referred to as, rather than blue bloaters, as pink puffers. So this is just a summary slide that just sort of shows you um, similarities between chronic bronchitis and emphysema in terms of airway obstruction and air hunger and 
subject to frequent infections and ultimately re uh, respiratory inf uh, infection. But the ca the causes of the disease are quite quite similar, but the the actually uh, the pathology is somewhat different with chronic bronchitis. You have irritation and chronic inflammation. With emphysema, you have um, fibrosis. Okay, um, I heard a couple of questions. It sound like so. Let me see if I can address this. Okay, Emily. Yes, and I and I didn't elaborate on this, but yes. So um, because with bronchitis, you have a loss of cell. You will tend to have mucus pooling in the lungs, which will increase the susceptibility of the lungs to infection. So you will have uh, people who have chronic bronchitis will tend to uh, have frequent infections. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen here. So is there not a great deal I want you to know about uh, lung cancer? Um, except that um, compared to breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer combined, com combine all those, more people die from lung cancer and all those other cancers combined. Now, luckily for the first time, probably definitely in my lifetime, probably longer than that, this year in 2019, I guess I should say last year, in 2019, we, for the first time in, I don't know how long, saw a reduction in the number of lung cancers. And it's primarily because fewer people are smoking. 90% of all lung cancers are due to exposure of carcinogens in cigarette smoke. This is not to say that everyone who smokes will get cancer, right? Uh, only about 10% of people who smoke get cancer, but one out of 10, yeah, that's, that's a big number. When, when you talk about getting a chronic disease, that can kill you. So, you know, the people who say, oh, such and such smoked all their lives and they never got cancer. Well, most people who smoke do not get cancer, but one out of 10 of them do. And when they do, the prognosis is not good. Typically, there's only a 17%, or at least a few years ago, I don't think this has changed that much, but but um, a few years ago when I made this slide, only the, the five-year survival rate was 17%. I have known people to get colorectal cancer and 10 years ago, and they're still here. Um, I don't know anyone that... Um, has gotten lung cancer that's still here personally. I'm sure there, there are people out there now, but it's it's it is almost a death sentence in a very, very short period of time. Okay, so the last thing I want to cover are developmental aspects of respiratory system. We're gonna look at changes that occur in the respiratory system from birth uh, till adulthood, and then as we get older, we're going to mention infant respiratory distress syndrome and how to <clears throat> um and strike and how to decrease its risk. We're just going to describe infant respiratory distress syndrome. Um, we're going to describe asthma. What we are going to talk about also is SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome and how to decrease that risk. So add sudden infant death syndrome and how to decrease that risk. And then I'm going to mention a little something about cystic fibrosis and how that uh, affects the respiratory system. Okay, and then lastly, we'll talk about changes that occur uh, from um, um, adulthood to old age with respect to the respiratory system. All right, so your lungs really have no function when you are in the uterus. Uh, the, the fetal lungs are filled with fluid. Basically, oxygen is obtained by diffusion from maternal blood to fetal blood. So, the lungs don't start to function until after that fluid is drained when the baby takes the first breath after birth. So, the lungs are one of the last organs to 
develop. And in fact, they're not fully inflated until about two weeks after birth. I mentioned the surfactant when I was talking about the, um, the respiratory membrane. Well, specifically, I talked about surfactant secreting cells. I said that they're found in the respiratory membrane, that they secrete the surfactant, that lower surface area, and it prevents the lungs from collapsing every time we exhale. Why don't we want the lungs to collapse when we exhale? Well, one, we always want air in the lungs to participate in gas exchange. Two, whenever you blow up a balloon, what's the hardest part of blowing it up? Well, when you're first putting air in it. The same thing is true of the lungs. It takes a lot of effort to inflate the alveoli. So we don't want them collapsing every time we exhale. So that's the importance of the surfactant. Well, that surfactant is not present until late in fetal development. So starting around 28, 30 weeks is where you'll see sufficient surfactant being produced to prevent collapsing of the lungs. So in premature infants, especially if they're born prior to 28 or 30 weeks, there may not be enough surfactant to prevent collapsing of the lungs. And so you get a situation where Every time the infant exhales, you get collapsing of the lungs. And so that's called infant respiratory distress syndrome because it, it requires an enormous amount of, of energy in order for the infants to breathe. And this accounts for, or at least at the time I made this video, which was probably about four years ago, this accounted for about 20,000 of newborn deaths in the United States annually. Some of the procedures that are used to um, um, mitigate these effects is they'll put an infant uh, on a um, ventilator and it keeps positive pressure on the lungs. So in other words, the lungs never deflate as they're exhaling. Um, some other, uh, and they'll do this until there's sufficient surfactant present. There are, there's also some um, synthetic um, forms of those surfactant that can be produced and are sometimes um, um, administered. Okay, so that's um, infant respiratory distress syndrome. Lastly, I want to talk about, well, it's not lastly, but I also want to talk a little bit about sudden infant death syndrome. And the reason why I talk about, I, I really like to talk about this is because it really illustrates how knowledge and knowledge that gets um, distributed to the population at large can really benefit society. Sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, is when a otherwise healthy infant stops breathing and dies in their sleep. And there's really no reason that can be nailed down for it. It is believed that it is a problem of the respiratory, the neural control of the respiratory system. But we don't know for sure. What we do know is that we can significantly reduce the risk of SIDS by placing infants in the supine position, basically on their back. And in fact, when we look at the history of SIDS deaths, which I'm going to show you, there's been a greater than 50% drop in mortality. So this is a graph that I got from, um, where did I get this? Oh, the uh, American Association for Pediatrics. And what you're looking at here on the x-axis here is years from 1988 to 2006. And I know this is quite a few years ago, but there hasn't been a lot of change since then. When I look, when I look at the, uh, when I last looked at the updated, uh, updated graphs, most of the change happened in the 90s. What you're looking at on the uh, y-axis is the number of deaths per thousand live births, and then this little green um, line here basically is the percentage of reported back sleeping. That is the percentage of babies that in surveys were found to be uh, sleeping on their backs. Now, 
when I was, I was born in the seventies. When I was born in the seventies, the recommendation by pediatricians was you place babies on their stomach. So if they throw up, so if you put them on their back and they throw up, they could choke on their own vomit, which doesn't appear to be a thing. I, I think babies just turn their heads to the, to the side and the vomit comes out. But anyway, that's what the recommendation was back then. Look at what the, where the SIDS rates were in, say, the, the, the late 80s. For every 1,000 births, we had anywhere from, um, well, I should say for every 3,000 births, we had two babies die from SIDS, shown here in the yellow bars. Um, in 90, starting in 92, and also in 93, the American Association of Pediatrics began to recommend back sleeping and noticed that you had a slight decline in slids, SIDS. Then in about 94, there, there was an actual campaign to educate pediatricians and the public at large that they could reduce the rate of SIDS by making sure that infants were sleeping on their back. And as that campaign gained steam and you had more people putting their babies on their backs, we see this pronounced decline in SIDS rates, such that by 2006, it had fallen greater than, it, to about a third of what it was back in 1988. And this is due principally because we had a huge increase in the number of people who were putting babies on their backs, sleeping on their backs. I like showing this graph because this really shows that if you like how knowledge can make knowledge and application of knowledge can have a huge impact on individuals, families, and society as a whole. Asthma is a chronic disease caused by uh, hypersensitivity. Basically, the bronchioles um, vasoconstrict, so you get um, decreased movement of air into and out of the lungs. This is associated with wheezing, and you typically have associated with that coughing as well as dyspnea or air hunger. Sorry, didn't mean to uh, didn't mean to skip this one. This so cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder. Um, it has effects on on multiple organ systems. With respect to how it affects the lungs, is that people with cystic fibrosis have this very thick mucus, and that mucus tends to accumulate in the respiratory system. And again, that that. Um, sets the respiratory system up for infections, and it can also interfere with gas exchange. So people with cystic fibrosis um, are often um, prescribed medications that will help um, make dilute that mucus and make it uh, less thick. And there are various um, procedures that parents are taught where they can, you know, slap the chest, clap the chest to try to m m loosen up that mucus. And because these individuals uh, tend to um, um, get frequent infections, they may also be administered uh, antibiotics frequently. Okay, what happens to the respiratory system as we age? Well, let's start at newborns. So newborns, have a, a very high respira, uh, respiration rate, 40 to 80 breaths a minute. When they become infants, some months later, that drops to about 30, and then we see this, you know, persistent decline from five to, uh, I'm sorry, um, to adulthood, right? Um, to be, our respiration rate is our is lowest when we um, are hit our 20s or our probably mid 20s. And there it pretty much remains uh, until we until we get into old age, probably around you know 60 or so. And then it begins to creep up a little bit. Um, let's talk a, a little bit about what happens in our teenage years, where our lungs, believe it or not, actually develop into our early teens. And if one smokes prior to the complete development of their lungs, 
they can actually arrest the development of their lungs permanently. So they can permanently stunt, if you will, the growth of the growth and development of their lungs and limit their vital capacity permanently. What happens as we age? Well, as we age, we our lungs do lose their elasticity. That is associated with a drop in our vital capacity. That's amount of air that we can move into, a maximum amount of air we can move into and out of our lungs. Typically, it's we've lost about a third of that by our, our age 70. Associated with that, we tend will we will tend to have a lower blood oxygen levels and an increase in carbon dioxide levels as well. It is uh, um, hypothesized that it may be the uh, we may see a decrease in sensitivity to carbon dioxide and pH that uh, as we age, which might cause sleep apnea. It's also believed, I didn't mention this, that uh, it is hypothesized, I shouldn't say believe, hypothesized by some that uh, in some infants, there's their sensitivity for carbon dioxide hadn't developed yet, and that might be a cause of sudden infant, uh, sudden infant death syndrome. So it's sort of interesting that it may be this lack of um, sensitivity to carbon dioxide that affects our um, respiratory system both at birth and toward the later stages of our, of our life. And as we get older, um, um, the macrophages and the cilia in our lungs tend to become a little more sluggish and therefore we're not as good as uh, fighting off respiratory infections. Okay, that is it for the respiratory system. Before we jump into the urinary system, does anyone have any questions? Got about eight minutes. I do want to try to get as far as I can so that we're not like rushed, rushed, rushed in our last two days of class. Questions, please. Okay, so I'm going to close out today by lecturing on the urinary system. And if you recall, I had asked you to watch the screencasts on the introduction to the urinary system where you're basically introduced to this is the urinary system, this is the, this is the anatomy, and this is what it does. And then specifically on the nephron, the anatomy of the nephron, because the nephron is, is the basic unit of the um, kidney, and it's what makes urine, which is really where we're going to focus now. So hopefully you watch the introduction to the urinary system and the nephron, because now I'm going to talk about how urine formation is completed. Now, about an hour ago, I did check to see how many of you had completed the self-test, because if you recall, I said not only watch these screencasts, but also do the self-tests that follow them so that you sort of have an understanding of how well you're understanding the concepts. An hour ago, I had two students that had actually completed the self-tests, okay? And they were my top two students in the class. One of the things I always tell students is it's not the smart students who perform best and the students who are most academically challenged that perform worst. It's really about habits. The students who are performing the best in this class are doing so because they have good habits. The instructor said, watch these screencasts and do these self-tests. And they did that. That's why they are the top students. Okay? So habits, habits, habits. Do the things that your instructors tell you will benefit you because they will. That's why they're telling you to do these things. Remember, we were all students at one point formally, right? We still are. Okay. So please complete those self-tests because they let you know if you're understanding the concepts or not. Okay. All right. Let's jump in here in the time we have left, right? We're good. <clears throat> so, um, I do not know why I included that. All right. So we're going to talk about urine formation. Okay, so first we're going to explain the process of filtration, explain the process of reabsorption, the process of secretion, and we're going to describe the normal characteristics of urine and list substances that are normally found in urine and list substances that 
uh, that when found in urine may indicate disease. Now, obviously, we're not going to finish all of these. I'm hoping we can get through filtration, reabsorption, and secretion at least. All right, so this is a urine specimen. Of course, if you pee in a cup, this is what it looks like. Where does urine come from? Well, we know that what makes it is the kidney, and the kidney makes it from whole blood right? So everything that's in your, your urine was once in your blood. Specifically, it's made from the plasma. And if you look at plasma, that amber-colored liquid portion of blood, it looks a lot like urine, does it not? Well, it's because urine comes from the plasma, as you're going to see. All right, this is a schematic from your book, and I actually emailed you an image of this to today. And this basically is a great illustration of the three processes involved in urine formation and where they occur. Now, this is a schematic of the um, nephron. So if you look at the nephron in your book, right, it's a lot more complicated looking than this. Okay, but that's what the schematic is. It sort of makes it sort of bottom lines everything, right? So if you covered the nephron anatomy um, this weekend. This is the renal corpuscle here, surrounded by Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. And then this here represents the renal tubule and the surrounding peritubular capillaries. If you're like, what is he talking about? make sure you watch the screencast on the nephron, okay? And you diagram the components of the nephron. That's sort of required in order to understand how the nephron works. So there are three processes that are involved in the production of urine. They are, number one, filtration. And filtration occurs here at the renal corpuscle. Anything small enough to cross the walls of those capillaries are filtered from the blood into the glomerular capsule. And that process is called filtration. It's not much different than, say, filtering water or like your, the, fil the filtering that your coffee maker does, right? Where it allows certain substances to cross it, but it doesn't allow the big grounds or the beans to cross. That process is called filtration. Basically with filtration, any, the, anything that's in the plasma that's small enough is filtered. So everything in the plasma minus the plasma proteins is filtered. Well, that's going to include glucose and amino acids and ions that the body needs. Well, we don't want to lose that. So after filtration in the renal tubule, we want to reabsorb everything that the body needs. So we want to reabsorb most of the water, glucose, amino acids, calcium, phosphorus, and other ions that the body needs. Now, during that filtration process, everything that the body needed to get rid of was not filtered. So there are still some things that should be moved from the blood into the renal tubule. And so the third process, which also occurs in the renal tubule, is secretion, where substances are actively secreted from the blood into the renal tubule. After those three processes of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion, what remains is what we call urine. And it's mainly composed of water, waste products, and substances that we have an overabundance of, like you know, sometimes hydrogen ions, sometimes potassium ions, etc. Okay, so these three processes, I'm going to go into some detail about starting on Wednesday. And then we'll cover ions and water balance. And then on Friday, we'll finish by covering acid, base, balance, and homeostasis. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.